Hey, thanks come back to the channel. There are a few things I want to address in this episode about the consoles themselves and generally about how gear is covered here on the channel. The reality is I don't often own the more expensive gear covered here on the channel and only get a set amount of time before it all has to go back to whomever was nice enough to loan it out in the first place. Usually that's plenty of time to get the gear out and actually use it, contact the manufacturer with questions, and experience a bit of what owning it feels like as a typical end user, so I can share that here with you. That being said, it doesn't always go as planned. Recently, I think we've all experienced that not much in 2020 has been going as planned, and I'm bringing all this up since in the last video in this series, I mentioned that I'd be looking at the DAW control functionality of these two consoles, and specifically with Reaper, and I was wrong. Unfortunately, at the time of filming this video, the current firmware on the wing has not implemented DAW control. It's just not there. I was hopeful when a developer reached out randomly with a tentative offer of some beta firmware some weeks back that I would be able to at least do some rudimentary testing with, but unfortunately that arrangement just didn't pan out. It's not a criticism or a complaint, just the reality of how things go sometimes. While I've had these consoles, the industry and the world has been dealing with some incredible challenges. What I wanted to do with these consoles and what I wanted to cover during my time with them was ambitious for the best of times. And I don't think a couple of months ago, any of us predicted how much everything would be affected in the industry. So the wing was a lot of fun. It's a really interesting product. It's definitely in development. Uh, there's some folks doing some really cool stuff with it. Dig into it on their forums, on the Facebook groups, and watch other YouTube videos. I'll link a few down below as well. There's folks out there using it in real world situations with other hardware that I don't have access to, with live bands that I don't have access to right now, and doing streaming and all sorts of different things with the wing. So definitely talk to the folks who are actually using them if you're considering buying one and make sure the features that you're considering buying it for have been implemented in a way that's going to work for you. Other than that, they're pretty cool and I'm glad I had a chance to spend some time with it and I hope I'll get to check it out later on in its development when it's a little further down the road with firmware and its accompanying software. So putting the wing aside for a moment, the Studio Live mixers will do DAW control and along with their own DAW software, Studio One 4, they are also designed specifically with Logic and Pro Tools control in mind. Now I wasn't aware before when mentioning Reaper that while it is an awesome DAW, not all DAWs implement MCU and HUI control in the same predictable ways. It has to be accounted for. So while you absolutely can get some functionality in Reaper with HUI MCU control, controllers like the PreSonus Fader Port 8 or the Behringer X-Touch series controllers, mapping all of the controls to useful parameters and remembering or labeling them for future use would be a bit more involved than the plug-and-play experience that you're probably hoping for. And that's really the question you have to answer with any controller you add to software these days, isn't it? Does it provide meaningful workflow benefits and will you use them if their implementation is less than seamless? Like most people, I think nowadays I use a ton of keyboard shortcuts with all of the different software I use. And repeatedly moving my hands away from the keyboard or mouse to complete a task really needs to be worth the time it takes or I just won't think to do it. The idea of turning knobs to set an EQ seems like a good idea, but if you needed to make a known adjustment, say cutting 3 dB at 250 hertz on a specific channel, I'm much faster typing those numbers into the needed dialog box I accessed using a shortcut. Augmenting tasks in a meaningful way so that your workflow actually benefits from the tools is everything. If a knob is changing a parameter, it needs to be there when you need it in a logical place and alongside related parameters that will likely be needed as well. Otherwise, you're going to need the mouse and keyboard anyway, right? Yeah. The only way I've seen this really work in practice is with higher end software and hardware combinations that were specifically designed from the outset to complement each other. Being able to match hardware buttons and knobs to what you see on screen and laying them both out in a logical and efficient way that improve workflow is the difference between controllers that are a novelty and those that you will actually use. While Avid Pro Tools control surfaces do this all very well, it's nearly $5,000 for the S3 controller, which includes only 
basically two channels of audio inputs, and that makes a difficult thing to justify for the average home studio owner. Adding the cost of higher channel count audio interfaces and, of course, the software, the Avid route is obviously a premium route to take, as industry standards usually are, but if you need that kind of compatibility, then paying for it is easily justified. There's a really great video series by Neil Parfit recently. Hey, it's Neil Parfit. About the new Apple Mac Pro rack when he got it and integrated it into his setup and how he justifies the cost of the higher-end industry standard hardware when he's working daily with uh, large production houses. You just simply have to have that kind of communication and compatibility. The price starts to come down when you factor in what it's costing you in time to deal with workarounds. So with that being said, it's no wonder why PreSonus has put so much work into developing their Studio One DAW software in recent years. It's maybe even less surprising that Behringer recently announced back on uh, March 8th, I think it was, that they are also working on their own DAW software, specifically uh, with the idea of marrying it seamlessly with their growing number of hardware control products. They have all sorts of different stuff now that you can buy, not just the wing that does this, as does PreSonus. So they're integrating more control into their mixing boards as well as offering standalone controllers and designing those uh, with a specific piece of software in mind just seems to be a much better way to deliver usable functionality in the end product. So hopefully we'll see that Behringer DAW in beta in that 12 to 18 month period that they announced back on March 8th of this year. But for now, we can look at Studio One, Four, and the Studio Live mixers and see how those have been integrated and what that experience is like. I'm sure this video will get tons of questions on how to set up DAW mode on the Studio Live mixers, and I have done a video on that previously, and I'll link it below. All of the many questions I've had on DAW mode with these mixers have all come down to either network configuration issues on the user's network hardware or confusion simply between the two aspects of what's going on here. So just to clear that up with these types of mixers with DAW mode or DAW control, what we have to be thinking about. One side of the device is acting as your audio interface. That's the mixer side. You plug in your mics and then you can route the direct outs from those channels or you can process those channels through a mix bus and route that out through the USB channels that you want them to show up on in your computer. Same goes for playback from the computer. Those show up as inputs on the mixer as well when you select the USB as an input option and then you can route those through the mixer to physical outputs on the audio network, on the console, console anywhere you want. Then separately from that, we have the device acting as a controller. So when I hit this DAW button and the faders flip, this thing is now just a big mouse. Everything you see here is just a representation of what's happening in the software. So I can move a fader here and it'll move the fader in the DAW. So having the controller and the audio interface functionality separated in your mind when you're setting things up and you're routing and you're trying to understand the signal flow through this system is really important and you've just got to slow down and try to really think about what you're trying to accomplish and what the most efficient way to get there is when you have this much flexibility. It's very difficult sometimes to troubleshoot people's problems because they're looking for a simple one-to-one -one answer of when I plug something in here, why is it not showing up where I expect it? And the, the answer a lot of times is, is because there's a lot of flexibility and you really have to tell everything what you want it to do in some instances uh, to get the result you're expecting. Now, Studio One, the great part is, has some awesome templates for this. So you can go in and tell it uh, that you are using a 64S and you want to just have a blank template using that as a controller and an audio interface, you can pull that up and all of the heavy lifting and routing and things are done for you. And you can set up those templates and it's really interesting the way they integrate the DAW with the mixer because the, the mixer just mirrors that so well. Everything's accounted for and what you're touching feels appropriate for what you're seeing on the screen. And the cool thing about the Studio Live uh, Universal Control software as well as the Studio One DAW software is that you can set up so many different
different screens to show really anything that you want functionality wise or detail wise on a channel level, a mix level, a metering level across the whole mixing board or the whole software. It's really simple to set that up. So they give you a lot of big picture overview uh, options and a ton of flexibility to really do whatever you need. So it's a cool, cool integration when they set out to do both uh, with from the hardware and software side together. It really does make a huge difference on what they can accomplish compared to just having some fader control and some transport control, which is nice. But again, when you're in actually mixing, when I'm actually working with audio, it's not that often that I'm sitting there you know, doing a ton of tweaks in a row. A lot of that stuff's almost, you know, like keyframing and video. You're going in and doing the automation point by point. Uh, you're doing, you know, fine adjustments and things that are going to be very easy to do with shortcuts and, and a mouse nowadays. We're used to doing it that way. So again, the idea of searching around for an EQ setting with a bunch of knobs, it seems less than practical to me anyway, but maybe that fits your workflow. But I think the folks that are going to want that kind of workflow are going to want this tighter integration that you're able to do with both uh, DAW and hardware combined. So I think we're going to see more of that from all manufacturers in the future. I, I don't know how you would go about competing with this uh, designing hardware as a controller unless it's just incredibly universal and they have the budget to actually write and support the the software necessary to have it continually work with so with uh, popular DAWs that are being used in different uh, editing programs. Uh, it's a bigger challenge than you would think. You know, you, you open something. I have the IO Station 24C on the desk right now. That's what I'm using as an interface. It's a really nice unit for the price, but you would think you could just open up any piece of software and and, oh, sure, they should map that. But there's tons of software out there. And I probably use a different combination of video editing and audio editing software than the next person. And having an inexpensive controller and audio interface just mapped to everything, they have to pick their battles as far as what's supported, especially with multiple platforms. And everybody also wants support for uh, you know newer platforms and older platforms and everything else and versions of software and some people don't update and they don't, oh, I don't ever want to put my thing on the internet. And some people update a few cycles behind and, you know, you just got to pick your battles. So I really think this kind of focused hardware and software integration is going to be something we all benefit from in the future. Let me know how your experiences have been with DAW control and software control in general and using controllers with different things than they're supposed to be used for. And if you would prefer just to have something come out of the box and work and uh, how big of a priority is that for you? Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.